my great pleasure to introduce two people who probably need no introduction. Uh, they are shining stars in our cultural landscape. Um, but I'm going to read a very brief bio, and I've said to both of them, if I went through all of their accolades, we wouldn't have any time left for actual discussion. Tony Ayres is a showrunner, writer, director, and founding member of Matchbox Pictures. His works have won multiple awards. His 2009 film, The Home Song Stories, alone winning 20 awards, including a New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for script writing. Tony was sh the showrunner and director on The Slap, written by Christos Chalkas, which won five actor awards and was nominated for a BAFTA and an International Emmy. And he was producer on Barracuda. His upcoming feature film is Ali's Wedding, which is being billed as Australia's first Muslim rom-com. Please welcome Tony. <laughs> Christos Cholkas is an award-winning author, as well as a playwright, essayist, and screenwriter. He's best known for The Slap, which was shortlisted for the 2009 Miles Franklin Literary Award and longlisted for the 2010 Man Booker Prize. All of Christos's novels, bar one, have been adapted for film or television. Most recently, of course, Barracuda. His writing has won multiple awards, most recently the University of Southern Queensland Steel Rudd Award for his short story collection, Merciless Gods. Please welcome Christos. Thank you. Now, thanks to the generosity of Matchbox Films, we're going to open with a brief scene from Barracuda. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Um, for me, this is one of the most powerful moments in recent modern Australian television. And after watching it and weeping through it, I went back to the book to find the scene, only to realise that it wasn't in there. <laughs> so I thought this was the perfect starting point for a discussion about uh, translating a book like Barracuda onto the screen. But let's start with the book, because that's where it all began. Christos, take us back to Ooh. the original ideas, and I know with you it's often questions, that inspired this particular book? Oh, look, um, I'll try and be very quick for a process that is quite complicated and doesn't um, uh, actually can take years to, to, to coalesce. So the, uh, the, when I've talked about it in the past, and I think it is still the best metaphor, it's like um, there are all these dreams running down a mountain of ideas. Um, and questions that I had, and one of them was about success and failure, uh, and the strange relationship between both those things, that I think um, we all know the uh, destructiveness of failure, um, but there's also 
an element of danger and destruction that can come from having success, and I'd had success with the slap. So I think that was one of the streams. The other one, and again, connected to what happened in the previous novel, uh, a, a real determination to write about class mm -hmm. in, um, in this country and, and in our world, and um, trying to work, you know, class is something that we, I think we have great difficulty talking about because it's, it's changed, and part of the novel for me is that there are three generations of family, all who have very different experiences about, about class. And the, the other element, well, and then there's the sports element. There was, um, you know, I was talking with a, an English friend just the other day who was saying, you know, on the other side of the world, there are two things they know about Australia. It's still the, the la you know, the neighbours home and away ideal of the suburbia, and the other one is sports. And um, I just, I, want, I thought there is something in the sports metaphor because of what it means in this country that will also allow me to explore those questions. And I, you know, part of the structure of Barracuda as a novel was I knew that the games that Danny Kelly was going to dream of, when he, he, he has these dreams of being an Olympic swimmer, and it had to be the Sydney 2000 Games because that, those are the, the Olympics that are, would allow me to reflect on this nation mm. and what was happening. Mm. So all those things were, were going into um, Barracuda. And, and, and swimming, oh, oh, and specifically? It had to be swimming because I can swim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really so I'm a passionate footballer. <laughs> yeah, weightlifting was out. I love football, but I'm a shite footballer. <laughs> and, I, and not that I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near... A, 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 I'm not a... A swimmer like, nowhere near a swimmer like uh, Danny, but I, kn I felt that there was something about water, being in the water that I could draw on as a writer. And I also think there's something about the metaphor of water for me. Uh, that the, other, the other stream, if you like, is, is, is it's a novel about uh, belonging. Uh, mm. And, you know, for a lot of really complicated historical cultural reasons, the question of how we as Australians find belonging is, mm. is, is a, 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 a difficult question because of the history of um, the colonial history of this country. So mm. water is where I felt, you know, when I'm away from this country, when I think about what gives me belonging, it's thinking about being in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I could, I could uh, mm. I, yeah, Danny Kelly had to be a swimmer. Mm. And you interviewed a lot of swimmers as part of the research for this book, didn't you? And I remember um, you talking about how you were, you were interviewing them largely in search of a language, their language. But it wasn't quite what came out of that, was it? <laughs> well, look, I'm really, I'm really fortunate. And, you know, we're, we're, we're all fortunate um, because there have been swimmers um, who have been very generous with their time, um, initially when I was writing the novel. And then, you know, Daniel Kowalski, Nicole Livingstone were, were working on the... consulting on it, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And they were, you know, just... The, you can't... Uh, there are things that I don't know about that world. I don't know... You know, I knew nothing about the, uh, the high elite um, athlete, athlete's world. And so very, very lucky that those people opened up to me. Very, very lucky that people who failed actually were very honest with me. And in a way, to be honest, that was much more important in terms of writing the novel, were the speaking to particularly a group of young people in their mid-twenties who had the same dreams as, as Danny. And they went through very, very similar experiences of having a dream that they'd worked on from such a young age. And that's what I... I mean, I... I had that dream of being a writer from... I, I would say from around the same age, but I could... I could muck up. I could take a lot of different paths to getting to that. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I, I could start writing at any age. And for these people, their bodies would fail them after their early 20s. They only had this really small window of being able to fulfill their dreams. And that, I found that heartbreaking as an older man talk, talking to them. Um, but in terms of the language, sorry, I'm, uh, in terms of the language, I just realised I'm the writer. Um, I would ask, what was it like to be in the water? And it, it happened again and again. 
I can't remember Christos. Or, you know, when, when, I'm, when I was in the water, I was somewhere else. That was as it's much as they language. gave me. And then I would go to the um, I would read. I read so many biographies and autobiographies by swimmers. And when it came to the actual description of the, the language of swimming, it was so flat. <laughs> it was really, I mean, because they, they, they weren't thinking of, about it as writers. And that there was something about that experience that was out of their body, in a sense. And, and that's, that's when I realised that that would be the, the main task of this book, was to, to try and get you as readers into, 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 the, into the pool, into Which the water. Which is, uh, is some of the most beautiful writing in the book. I've been going back through it, and those descriptions of Danny's transformation in the water are absolutely stunning. But, of course, there's an adage in filmmaking that if you add water, <laughs> you add... You escalate the costs massively. <laughs> so and, um, and was, that, was that a disincentive for adapting this particular novel? No, no, it was absolutely not. I mean, it was a challenge for us to work. And the, we had a wonderful director, Rob Connolly, and a fantastic uh, cinematographer, Stefan Duscher. And they worked very hard in trying to work out a visual language which very much came from the, from the novel. It was all about yeah. how could we try to evoke the feelings that we all felt when, when we read the book. And it's, I think we saw that beautifully in a moment of that, um, that short clip. It's one of the really outstanding um, textures of, of the series for me was exactly that, that I, th I feel like you managed to capture um, that feeling beyond language of being in the water. I, I think the challenge is because we've all seen so much swimming and, we, and we, we, we wanted to work out a way of trying to do it which we hadn't seen before that was a bit more stylized, but kind of captured the feelings that you have when, well, you know, even when, personally, when you swim well, you have a certain, it, it's almost meditative. Yes. I'll take you guys' words for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I'm interested in, uh, Tony, obviously, this is the second of Christos's books that you've worked on. Um, what is it about Christos's books and Barracuda specifically that, that inspires Matchbox films? Um, I, I think Christos is a, what, one, uh, Christos's writing, he, he has a genius for just touching on really important issues that speak to, you know, what we as a national culture are, are, are thinking about or should be thinking about, and the, the way that uh, he has a bit of a, a kind of fuck you <laughs> quality to it as well. You know, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a, you know, like Barracuda is a, is Rocky plus fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to use that. Thank you, Tom. That's, that's pretty um, cool. Uh, and, and that's very appealing. Uh, uh, so he manages to do that. He also writes in a very muscular, visual way. So it's, it's very adaptable. And both on the slap and on Barracuda, uh, whenever we kind of reached a, a point in the writers' room, because you know we construct our dramas with a group, group uh, with writers in the writers' room, and Christos is often involved in that mm. process. Whenever we reached a, a, a point which, where we thought, "Oh, that's not working," or "How do we deal, deal with this?" the answer was always going back to the book. Yep. And um, so, certainly in Barracuda, you know, we, we had that experience as well. I mean, I mean, and the other thing about Christos is that. Um, he says very early, he has said to me both times very early in the piece that uh, that the the novel is his medium, but the the adaptation is ours. Yes. And so he gives us freedom to adapt. And uh, you know, we did some adapting in Barracuda, but obviously we did a bit more in. Uh, I mean, we did less in the slap, but yes. we did more in Barracuda. Yes. And let's talk about that because it's a it's a big it's a weighty tome. And, uh, and the story has uh, a very unique structure. Um, you've talked a bit about the structure before, about how you needed that structure to tell the story that you wanted. And it's, it's, uh, it's a dual storyline working yes. in different time uh, zones. So one storyline we're going back in time and one we're going forward in time. And that's a, almost impossible to do in film. So what's your starting point when you look, and also, of course, there's a whole side yeah. trip to Scotland and all kinds yeah. of stuff, um, which wasn't going to happen in the adaptation. What, where do you start? Listen, I, th I think that um, with any adaptation, you can, you can do things in so many different ways. I mean, we could have done something which was closer to the book, but for me, um, I read the book and I, I really loved it, but I had a very strong sense of how I would adapt it and which was to just try to import 
the th bigger themes of the book into that four-year section mm -hmm. wh where da Danny goes to um, uh, the college. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say I it. Don't think, I think we're being recorded. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. The and college, we all know what he calls it throughout yeah, yeah. the book. <laughs> and, and the 2000 Olympics. For, for, you know, when, when I read the book, I, 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 you know, I had a vivid sense that that was what I, I, want, I wanted to do with it. And then I remember we had lunch, uh, and I just pitched that to Christos, and he responded to it, and we went from there. So how did you feel about that prospect? Because it did involve, it did involve cutting a lot. Um, Danny's much older in the book than he, than he makes it to in the film. Um, there's, a, there's some major plot uh, changes. How did you, did you, do you ever, I know you're extremely generous and gracious about this stuff, but did you ever have those moments of like, <gasps> when it came to letting go of some of that material? I think there are, there are always with any adaptation the, the, the filmmakers are not going to know that there are particular, there may be a particular sentence that you've struggled with <laughs> for half, uh, half a year to a year to get right, or, and you're like, oh, and that's gone. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's a really wrong-headed way of um, understanding adaptation. Um, the best way, for, I, I always think, is to go from examples. So it was, I'm really glad we started with that moment. So, what I was able to do in, in, in the book is have an older man looking back. Um, and, you know, I've always said about this book, you know, because we've talked about it for a long time, and the book is dedicated to Angela, and part of it's Danny's quest and who he is comes from conversations about what it is to be good, what it is to be humane, mm -hmm. and that's really what the book is about. But being able to take Danny into his 30s in the book meant that I could do... Um, I could be patient with the sexuality stuff, so I always, from the moment I, I had the idea and from the moment I started writing, I knew that Danny Kelly was gay. But I, part of what the structure gave me was it allowed me to, um, to actually not have the coming out, you know, because right at the beginning of the novel, we see him as a man in his 30s with his um, lover Clyde in Scotland. So we know those things. I mean, I trusted that the reader didn't need me to uh, tell that story, we're familiar with that story, so that the reader is aware I'm trying to tell another kind of story. When it came to the adaptation, you sit down with the script writers, you sit down with Tony, you, you sit down with Amanda, and you, th you know that it's a very big ask. It's possible to do it, but it's a very big ask to have an actor who can play 16 and also play 35. That's, you know, film is uncompromising as a visual me medium. You as an audience are not going to accept um, um, that that's, that's the same actor. There's ways you can do it, but it's, it's mm. difficult. And so I understood right from the get-go that uh, it, it meant that the whole structure had to change mm. and that things that I was able to tell in that alternate structure, had to, that the filmmakers had to find another way of doing it. And that's a great moment for me. That pick, that's not in the book, but it's from the book. Absolutely. It's the book. I don't, you, you can't read Barracuda without realising that Danny has fallen in love with this, um, this uh, student, Martin. Martin, but he, he doesn't know how to express it. He doesn't have the words for it. And that's, that moment is, is, is beautiful. The other thing that happens in adaptation, and this is in theatre as well, and it's in film, and sometimes I think when we talk about film and theatre, we don't talk enough about performance, right? So what happens is these actors, they take, a role, they take a character that you've created, it comes from your writing, but they imbue it with their wisdom, with their knowledge, with their experience, with their, in Elias's case, with his raw energy as a, mm -hmm. as a you know, late he adolescent. He embodied it, didn't he? Completely. And the, we talked, I mean, I've talked with Angela about this, and it's, it's one of my favourite moments in the series is where he fails at the um, Commonwealth Games, mm. you know? And I wrote that in the book, but seeing a 17-year-old Hal, just physically seeing that performer give that performance, gives it a power yeah. through, it, through his physicality, through his, his rawness again, that I, I think is much more terrifying than, than what happens in the book because you're seeing a yeah. young man fall yeah. apart and you're seeing an actor 
deliver that. Yeah. I, I felt the same way I thought. We, I didn't have the full impact of, his, of just how yeah. young he was and just how vulnerable he was until I saw it on the screen. That was an, aston an equally astonishing moment, I thought. I mean, one of the things we were really, was really important to us was trying to import the ideas from around, around af after the time frame. And, and Christos absolutely nailed it when he said uh, the whole idea of an actor change and trying to age an actor. And I mean, it, it's very hard to do, you know, particularly, convincingly. yeah, convincingly given you know, our, the resources that we have for, for our, our work in Australia. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, I felt that it would have taken us to another place. And the other thing about Bar Barracuda was that it's so deeply embedded in point of view, and, if you, and the point of view of that young boy, and I think that if you broke that point of view, even by cutting to an older version of him, um, you, you, you lose some of the contract with the audience, which is, you know, we're going to give you this experience of what it is to be fated, to be considered the best in the world, the best, and to be promised all these things that if you are the best. Mm. And that was the thing that, you know, we, you know we, we felt that would be what would emotionally engage an audience. And, I mean, it's kind of like... It, so different from the slap, the way we did the slap as well, where we kept shifting point of views from yes. episode to episode. What, what we did, I mean, Danny is basically in every scene yeah. uh, across four hours, and it's just his experience. Mm. Mm. And it is, at, at the same time, it has this extraordinary ensemble cast yeah. around him. And again, I think that is a real strength of, of your work, and it's obviously a strength of Christos's writing, um, that you have this not only a fantastic ensemble cast, but an ensemble cast that reflects the Melbourne or the Australia I know, yes. um, that is not commonly reflected in popular culture. And um, in her uh, quite stunning um, opening address for Melbourne Writers' Festival, Maxine beneva Clark talked about this. She talked about um, the power of literature to render people invisible, the power of popular culture to render people invisible. And it seems to me that the work that you are doing independently and collectively is about... Um, creating spaces for a whole range of voices, classes and ethnicities that we don't see in run of the mill Australian TV. How conscious are you of doing that? How, how much are you kind of committed to that as a political project or as a kind of, is it just a, a byproduct of working with someone like Christos's work? I, I think that, you know, it starts as being a, you know, a byproduct of who you are and, you know, you tell stories that are close to you as, as a starting point and then, you kind of look around and you realise that, you know, that they do sort of pop out because they're, they're, they're different from the other stories. And then um, I, I do think, feel like the longer uh, I work in this business, the more committed I am to trying to te continue telling those stories. It, uh, but it feels like it's kind of diversity by stealth because yeah, it's not really, you know, like it, that's, you know... The reason they call it cultural background is that it's the background, you know, like yes. it's not really the story. Yes. And uh, Barracuda is a story about, you know, winning and losing, you know, that, that's the story. But it's just set in a world which is like the real world. And, and it's not that hard to do, actually. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, yes. Um, uh, very true, actually. Um, and, and of course, it is also a story about class. Yes. which is, as Christos started off saying earlier, and I actually remember when we were having really early conversations about, about the story, and there were... One know, of the great things about doing this with friends is I can have your water, <laughs> can't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, we, I remember when we were talking about this very, in the very early days, and, and the Nick Darcy case was quite prominent, um, which was the case of the disgraced swimmer, who, um, who was also a butterfly swimmer, um, who was disgraced over a, a number of violent assaults. But I remember at the time, the part of the story that piqued your curiosity was the role of the father and the impunity with which the ruling class thought it could act. Yep. And I feel like that crept into um, Barracuda, not in the way we anticipate. Um, or did you think that Danny got a harsher um, treatment in the story because he wasn't part of the ruling class? I think, I think de definitely the, um, I think Danny, he, he begins, he gets his scholarship to this very elite private school. And because of his phenomenal talent, he gets fated, as you said, Tony, and he gets accepted up to a point at this, um, at this school when uh, 
his success is no longer guaranteed. He's no longer part of that world. Mm. And I, what I drew on, I think, I, because I hadn't, I hadn't had that experience of that kind of uh, elite, education. elite education, but what I did have was the experience of going to the University of Melbourne as a young man and going from one world into a very, very different world. And there are things in Barracuda, and I've said about Barracuda, it feels like a first novel in a way. It was like a, I had to go find my way back to why is it that I want to write? <laughs> why do I want to be what? Uh, and really, I think the reason is quite selfish as a novelist, because these are, you, you just, there's something in your gut, you have to tell these stories. And so in the, in the novel and in the series, there's a, a moment where Danny is at a, you know, he's at the Sorrento or Portsea house. and Portsy, the Portsy, <laughs> um, And the matriarch says, um, oh, these people are, you know, you and I, you know, you're working class, I'm, you know, I, I, we know our class, we're better than these middle class people. That was said to me by an elderly woman when I was 17. You know, you, 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 you and I have an authenticity that they will never have. That's what they want. And, you know, you tell that to a 17-year-old and you don't know how to make sense of it. It took me, and still, I'm not sure if I've made it, but it takes, tw you know, 20, 30 years for it to distill and become part of this novel. Um, and the Golden Boys and Golden Girls, I remember that first week at Melbourne Uni going, how could their teeth be so white? <laughs> how can they, you know, how can they... Um, so, I, yes, I think, I think class absolutely matters, but I think class is transforming. So, you know, our language that we use to try and make sense of class is, is, it hasn't kept up with, with, with what, what I think is happening on the ground in a country like here in Australia, but across the globe, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the Nick Darcy thing was also interesting because when I first heard the story, and sorry for just, uh, if he, it, he was uh, a swimmer, got disgraced, he, he viciously punched out a, a fellow swimmer. The, the Simon, the, the swimmer, ended up in hospital. I don't also, at the beginning, had heard, I think we talked about it, a classical mishearing. I thought Nick Darcy came from a working class world. Oh. I don't know, that was when I first heard the story and that's why I became interested in it. I wondered if this is a story about class. And then I found out very quickly, no. But it was. But, but, it was no, yes. but that's when, when you have that moment as a writer, as an artist, you go, well, okay, but I can write that story. Yeah. I write fiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can, I can tell the story. I do want to say, uh, I know a, a friend of mine was involved in a, in a punch-up in uh, that part of the coast, that Portsea coast. He comes from the, um, the, the far north of Melbourne. And uh, no, not, not even as damaging uh, um, uh, a violence. I'm not forgiving the violence, I'm just saying. And he ended up in jail. He had to do a, a jail term mm. because he was seen as an uh, outsider mm. coming into that world. So for me, in the novel, uh, um, I thought about it a lot. Does Danny go to jail? And I thought, well, no, that's part of the experience that defines him as always being outside that world. Before we go to questions from the floor, I'm putting you all on notice so that you can start getting your questions ready. And remember that questions end with a question mark, hot tip. Um, <laughs> we're going to have some roaming um, uh, volunteers with roaming mics. Um, but uh, before we do open to questions from the floor, um, we had a very funny conversation recently after you'd watched the whole um, series. And the series, we, I don't want to spoil it in case anyone in the room hasn't seen it, but um, you said, uh, at the end, that you hadn't realised that you'd written such a Christian novel, <laughs> and this coming from the, from the self-styled blasphemous author, and um, I'm interested in Tony, where it, it, you know, because we have got very big themes in this story, yeah. big themes about guilt and shame and redemption and atonement. Yes. Do you? Were you again? Were you conscious of that? Was was there any? Was there an attempt to? to sidestep it, to, to a kind of inevitability that you had to embrace in that narrative? What, 
we had no idea. Final scene, oh, honestly, we had is no quite idea. Astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> and even the director, Rob Connolly, just sort of said, someone pointed out that you know I was all deliberate that you know he's uh, there's a cross at the end, and the yeah. lines of the pool. We had no idea that we were doing that. That's exactly my response too, because it isn't. I spent years on this novel, and it's not until I see the TV series and it's the final image, and I won't give it away, but I think it is. And it's all wordless. It's, it's the image. Yeah. And that's when I remember turning to Wayne, my partner, and going, oh, my God, I wrote a Christian novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm in tears. I mean, I'm not, and I'm yeah. not being... I, I just I, think that Christianity doesn't have ownership over the idea of redemption. No, mm. no, 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 no. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No. Yeah. That fair, fair call. Maybe, and yes, maybe we're seeing reflected our yeah. own kind of yeah. cultural yeah. background in it. But um, yeah, it was pretty um, compelling nonetheless. Um, again, before we go to, to the audience, I just did want to ask you about the actors um, because you, I've heard you speak about working with actors um, in the context of the slap and you do seem to have this extraordinary capacity at Matchbooks to identify and nurture these young actors and I think a very strong sense of duty of care. What kind, were there any particular issues that you were kind of dealing with in the, in the making of this film? Apart from the fact they had to spend a lot of time in water. And mostly nude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and like, um, I mean, the, 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 the main cast, I mean, particularly Elias, had never, this was his first major role, and he was 17 years old, so he's actually younger than Danny yeah, yeah. is for most of the show. Mm. And he was phenomenal. We, we, I mean, we, have a, we work with a wonderful casting agent, Jane Norris, who's mm. actually Rob Connolly's wife. Mm -hmm. And so it's a bit of a family. And yes. ja Jane has this extraordinary eye for... I mean, Elias actually auditioned for another show that we do, Nowhere Boys, which is a kid show. Yes. and uh, Award-winning kid show. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he, and he auditioned for it three years ago. And Jane just remembered him and oh. sort of brought him back. And he'd grown up and he, you know, he'd filled out and... Uh, and he was, you know, he's Lebanese from a, you know, a si single mother, to, you know, working class background, really understood the role so fundamentally. And we honestly brought him in so many times because, you know, it's a huge risk because the whole show basically relies on, yes. on yeah. that, that casting choice. So I'm just going to say really, when you talk about casting and what I think Jane does yeah. phenomenally well is that she thinks she... The example I often use, but I, and you know, it goes back to your question, Ange, about you know how conscious are you about you know representing this world? Like, what what are the politics mm. of it? And I remember years ago I was working on a short film, and I'd written the script, and I had um, in one of the scenes it was clear it was a doctor, and you know she was a she was female, but that was as you know that came out in the exchange. But all I had was doctor, mm. and. The, that casting person sent me all the, sent us, I was sitting with the director, all these um, actors, and they were all blonde, and they were all blue-eyed, and they were all white. And I went, is there no one from another background who is auditioning for this? And they, she went, oh, but you didn't specify that they were an <laughs> Asian doctor or a <laughs> Euro, Middle East. Or, and it's that kind of blindness that I mm. think, are, we, in a way, we're not even conscious of it. You know, yeah, this only, person was the, not a bad person. The only person. colour we don't see is white. Is yes. white. Yes. So there is, I think, someone, you know, one of the thrills, and that's one of the things that's so different to the novel when it compa you know, and I do love cinema and television. It's a collaboration, and it works yeah. best when it's not... I mean, Rob's an amazing director. The yeah. actors are phenomenal. You're, uh, Jane's phenomenal, but it's the fact that all these talents are working together that yeah. makes it such a special art, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, we are going to open to questions from the floor. I've got a few if none of you have. Um, but if you'd like to raise your hand, I can direct the volunteers towards you. Yes, we've got one up the front. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I guess my question is, and it is really clear that there's a real collaborative approach here and, and perhaps it is a bit rare for an author to have quite so much involvement in the writing room in particular. 
Um, was there ever a moment, and, and, and again, Christos, you, you, your generosity is clear, but was there ever a moment where you actually sort of said to them, no, I, I think you've, you've misunderstood that point? Or was there, was there something where you stepped in a little bit more? Conflict. Uh, I, 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 mean, I, can, I can answer that. Go yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> there is one moment, moment right at the end where... You know, I was pushing for one thing, Christos was, uh, was pushing for something else, and it was really interesting. We didn't decide until the edits went, and Christos won. <laughs> 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 but he was right, you know, like, he, it was, it was re really interesting that, that uh, and it was around uh, Martin and the, sex, the sexuality story, you know, mm. the, like, uh, it was kind of interesting. There was a, there was, it was a good debate, and... Uh, uh, Christos's point, I thought, was great, which is that the story is about Danny. It was about whether Martin forgave him at the end, at the funeral, and uh, uh, yes. I. And Christos's point was that if you, if Martin doesn't forgive him overtly, forgive him, then um, then Danny has to learn, has to forgive himself. And that, that was such a great point. Mm. Yeah. He had to learn to... Oh, yeah. In fact, I remember on a very early draft of um, Barracuda saying pretty much the same thing, yeah. also at the funeral scene of saying, you know, Danny has to get beyond needing the approval of that yeah. group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it was do. actually Angela who It was, was actually me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean it like that. But um, um, Actually, to, to, to your question, I think that about collaboration, I think there were always those, those moments. I mean, you know, I had it with Tony, I had it with Rob, I had it with the actors. The actors would come up and go, what were you, you know, what was she feeling at this point? And you, you can get into a bit of an argy, uh, argy but I think there's something about the... Um, there's always an element of trust when you give over to your, your work to be ad ad uh, adapted. And I, was, I did a talk which I loved a couple of weeks ago at the VCA to screenwriting students and talking about that trust. But also, you know, I knew Tony um, not through him coming to the slap and saying, I want to do it. I knew you through other connections that were, that were artistic and were about film, but they were also social and they were about politics and they were about queer politics and so that going right into the, the, the 80s, you know, and it's this woman here, uh, you know, we met uh, at, at uni and we had connections, again, to do with ethics and politics and um, HIV and AIDS and that. So I've known these people before I was Christos Cholkis, the writer, and in a way, those are, that's where the trust in these collaborations comes from. You know, it's uh, that, that they're built on relationships that are not only about a film or a book. Uh, yeah. You know, you give over your work to someone like Matchbox because you know these people and you know their, their integrity. And those, those moments of clash, they're, they're really minor, <laughs> you know. I mean, I understand from having spoken to Christos about this process, that he is very generous and gracious about the stuff. Um, I mean, you are. You, you've talked about how... Well, actually, I think one way you put it was take the money and run, but there was also <laughs> another, another way you put it was, you know, that you have a very strong sense of these being different art forms. And I was thinking about, thinking about that, thinking about the novel and thinking about the television program. And forgive me for trying out an analogy, but it's, it's like there's a a melody that's the same in both, and you're riffing different jazz riffs off the same melody. So the themes are the same, and the heart of the story is the same, but what you're doing with literature and what you're doing with film turn it into something quite different. Yeah. They're variations on that theme. I think that's why, for me, um, that final, you know, that you're always nervous when you sit down and begin to see a work <laughs> that's been adapted. The first five, ten minutes you're is not hell. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, I know. I mean, if, you know, because you're just going, what if I don't like it? What if I don't like it? What am I going to, you know? And I've just been really fortunate in the main, you know, that so by the end of the, that four hours, I was just overwhelmed and, and, and really proud of, of, the, of the novel, but of the, of the TV series, but I keep going back to that final image, not as, you know, uh, just because it's not from the book, because it's done through the power of cinema, it's all in the image, mm. uh, but it gets to the heart of something I wanted to write about, mm. forgiveness and atonement, and that's, that's, 
special Very when that happens. And we even tried to put the Scottish boyfriend in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'll bring yeah. by the edge of the pool. Yeah. Um, I guess I, it was a question but, I actually put to Christos, Tony, was yeah. when I said to him, you know, they've done such an extraordinary job of distilling your novel. Um, you know, to what extent was that about you saying these are the themes, these are the things you're not you can't let go of and he he said no that was that was you guys you knew what what was at the heart of the story and what needed to stay we read the book <laughs> <laughs> right. you know it was basically yeah it was and you've talked a lot with Christos. So yeah. I mean, did also did that some of that stuff also affect we spent weeks in the writers room where we just yep. talked about you know with the you know, we had two amazing yeah. writers and, and it was actually that, that world record moment, I have to say, is Belinda Chaco, who wrote episode two. And um, I'm not even sure if we plotted it. And I just remember reading, like, the second draft and, and going, oh, he breaks the world record, wow. <laughs> 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 and it was such uh, an electric moment. And, and it sort of it... crystallised everything. Mm. And then he tells Martin, I did it for you. That is just... It's, that's what I mean, it was just such a stunning moment. Yeah. And I thought both actors played that moment with, to perfection. Yeah, yeah, because Martin's been freaked so, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But not so freaked out that he... I that mean, he there was also, yeah. I think, a sense of, of how um, privileged he was to be. Yeah. To have inspired that moment as well. And that's yeah. what was so... Well, for me, that's what was so magical about that moment, I think. Let's hear more from you. There's a question up there. Um... Lovely volunteer down towards the front. Here. Quick round of applause for the MWF volunteers, because they're awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, I was just curious about the process of deciding to do a four-part series instead of perhaps a film. And also from maybe a marketing sales perspective, just wondering, um, in terms of releasing it, all on iView straight away, um, how you actually made money from it. Good <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, basic, basically, you know, we talked about it, whether it was a film or a TV series. One, we felt that uh, in the year of the Olympics, it would be great for a lot of people to see the show. And, you know, in, in the end, you know, like over a million people watched every episode through the various forms. If it was a film, it would have taken us five years, so we'd be at the 2020 Olympics. Uh, <laughs> we, would, we would have, uh, it would have been an, you know, an art house film, it would have been hard to get people to watch it, it you know, like it, all, of the, it, all the reasons that films are, are kind of difficult at the moment, uh, and we would have had to reduce the story even more, so, so that, that was why uh, uh, t TV felt the right medium for this story, and uh, it, it, basically, once we had met and um, uh, Christos had agreed to work with with us on it, um, I went to the ABC and and they, they, it was a bold commission for them to to make a story about losing in the year of the Olympics. <laughs> uh, although, or, although it's a prescient, <laughs> it's a <laughs> very ti very timely. And uh, it was kind of interesting because I was following everything on Twitter and uh, the, someone else was saying, the Olympics is just like watching Barracuda again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, so, and, and then, you know, th th things are monetized ar around uh, uh, international sales and, um, you know, it... it it's kind of, I can't really talk about the money side of it. <laughs> to be honest, I don't really know. You're the creative, you're the creative type. <laughs> I never, I so never the, worry about that. Going straight yeah. to iView wasn't, so that wasn't an issue for you. That was absolutely, an, it's basically how the ABC are seeing the future of their dramas. Oh. They're, they're trying to put every, release everything on iView just because people just aren't watching drama in the same way that they, they used to watch. Mm -hmm. They're binge watching it. That's what they're more doing. Or yeah, yeah more, more or less. And Barracuda is very, you know, it's a, you know, it's a perfect size to to binge watch. Mm. You know, and a lot of you know a lot of people watched it that that way. It seemed to me just you know, it's it's hard to be completely objective, clearly, but it seemed to me that there was something about the fact that Rob Connolly was the director for all four episodes. It had a real visual consistency, yes. and so it felt like you could actually 
watch it all in four hours. You could yeah. sit down on iView and, and it, and that, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know what decisions they were making in the ABC, but it felt like it was a perfect um, work to do that with. Yeah. And in, in yeah. a weird way, it, yes. it's like a four-hour movie yeah. as well. Yes. That's, no, that's, that's another right. way That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I think it's because of that consistency. Yeah. And you've talked a bit, Christos, about, you know, you think television is the area where the, some of the most interesting stories are being told at the moment in contemporary popular culture. So, I mean, to what extent does... And I know I have asked you this question, but now that you've had so much of your work adapted, does it creep into your mind when you're writing? Do you start thinking about casting it or no. how it might look on screen or... No, I don't. I seriously... Uh, I, I, I seriously don't and I think that's partly having been fortunate enough to be almost like a spy in the world of film and see how it, how it works and I mean, to be really honest, when I was listening to Tony talk about whether a film or a TV series because I have been involved in my own experience but lots of friends who have tried to get films up and my God, you know, it, it is such a long process and it all depends on getting that right one superstar. And if they, they can't do it that month, your years of work just just uh, fall apart. I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a broken one because I have talked about this before, Ange, to you, but I think the way I think about film is as language. So yes, I think about film when I'm sitting down and writing, but it's more how does editing work in film? Mm -hmm. How does the language of film, and how do you what can you do as a writer to, um, um, to either mirror that or use some of the things that are possible in film um, as a novelist? Um, and with Barracuda, the, the perfect example is the notion of the jump cut in editing, you know, so where you move within an within a editing cut, you move through time, you know, you, the... And that's what I, th I did with the, um, the, the alternate mm. structures. Mm. I thought I'm going to use that notion of the jump cut as a novelist, so that we, we, we well, you as a reader don't necessarily have to read all. Again, I'll use the example of the coming out story, right? I'm, I'm, I've said with Barracuda, you all know the coming out story. I trust that you've had experiences of that yourself, or you know people have been. You know, we all live in families, and we all live in friendships, and we all live in love. So. I didn't want to write that story, so by, by using that notion of the jump cut, I could let each individual reader imagine the moment that Danny told his mother or told his father or told his sister or told his brother, you know, that, or told Demet, his best friend. You, you, you could do that work. I didn't need to do it. And I, mm. that's what I got from cinema, mm, mm, I think, is that notion. Mm, mm. Um, have we got other questions from the floor? Yes, one down here. I did ask Christos why, given his love of cinema, you'd never become a film, or you'd never considered becoming a <laughs> filmmaker yourself. I have cons I've, uh, because I know that I don't have. I, I, I mean, I love that form so much, and but I don't think I have a certain set of skills that are uh, that a, a director requires. Um, and I'm not being. I mean, uh, 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 I don't know if uh, I, patience a certain kind of patience, a certain ability to be both a, um, a, a collaborator but also a captain. I, I read a, I, or heard a great interview uh, with the independent American filmmaker Jim Jarmusch just the other day. It was the 20th anniversary of Dead Man, mm. which I, I, I love that Western, and he was talking about that, he was using that metaphor for as a captain, as a film director, you're a captain on this ship, and you know that you don't, have all the skills required. You really have to trust that the other members of your crew know what they're, what they're doing. Um, and, and I think in, one of the things I love about novels is actually that I can go, right, I can make up this, this world myself. I don't, I don't I, yeah, maybe I don't have the collaborative and organisational skills to be a director. Part of you that's a rampant capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there is. Let's, let's throw to the question from the floor. I've got a question for Tony Ayres. Um, I know he knew Tim Conagrave, and that he, I think he, you owned the film rights for a long time to the book Holding the Man. And I'm wondering whether you saw the film Holding the Man and what you thought of it. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I was just talking about it before this talk, and 
Um, I loved what uh, Tommy and Murphy and Neil Armfield did with Holding the Man. But uh, Holding the Man, uh, uh, Tim was a friend of mine and uh, I got the manuscript of the book uh, two nights before he died. It was, I've got the original thing that he printed out and, it's, um, and it was so moving and, and I'd never adapted a book before. So it was like how not to adapt a book. My first script was 240 pages and I couldn't work out how to change anything. And it was almost like I learned how to adapt through doing that because now I just don't do any of that anymore. Mm. Um, uh, so I, I just couldn't, I was the wrong person to do it that, you know, basically. Uh, and then, you know, it was a decade later that Tommy took the book and did a stage adaptation and he, he could see how to do it and he could move away from the book. I, I couldn't move away from the book because of uh, my relationship to Tim. Which is a very interesting, it's a very interesting observation about, you know, and particularly picking yeah. up on what Christos, what you were saying about how truncated and prolonged um, the process of adaptation can be. So it really is about finding the right book for you too. It's, it, I mean, really, I, nowadays, if I read a book, it's, it's about working out knowing how I would do it, you know, and yes. having a sense of what it is that is different and then taking the material from the book and putting it into the way that I would do it. Yes. Because I'd rather, you know, it's, a, it, 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 it's a, yeah, that, that's the way I, I would adapt things because they are different things. And so to, you know, but you're also, you, you you're kind of have to throw the book away a bit yes. and then bring it back. Yes. And then by throwing the book away, you actually find the book. Yeah. But you're also a storyteller yourself in your own right, Tony, and I reckon that shows because, and, and you know, curiously enough, um, Ali's Wedding, which we mentioned earlier yeah. and which we talked about earlier, um, has come from a story before it was a book and, in yeah. fact, through your intervention has, is, has now become a book. Yeah. So you've also, it's also got to be that ear for narrative, really. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and not understanding what form a narrative should take. Mm, mm. With the, um, any other questions from the floor? Because otherwise we'll get completely carried away. Actually... Yes, could I have a question? Or comment? Um, I'm, I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I know you. that I'm, I'm allowed... We, you wanted a question rather than a comment, but I just really want to say... I mean, first of all, thank you for the most beautiful, beautiful piece of work. I think one of the most um, beautiful love stories is really about the coach and, and the relationship that he had um, with Danny. And I just... I wonder if you want to comment on that, because we haven't mentioned that. I think yeah. it would be a shame mm. not to. I think and a hell beautiful. of a performance. Too. Yeah, look, yeah. Matt was... Yeah. I... I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was always one of, one of the most striking parts of the book for me, it was the relationship, you know, the, that duty of care that he had for, for Danny, which Danny didn't kind of always understand. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was very, it was very moving and... and um, I think Belinda did such a beautiful job in episode four of kind of summing it all up. And we, we also talked about how he also, the coach also had a journey because probably at the beginning of the story, he thought it was winning was everything as well. Yeah. And then by the end, you know, he had his own things that he was dealing with and he actually understood and could, was part of imparting, you know, uh, the, you know the part of activating the change in Danny. Mm. I mean, I think for, for me, that was, uh, it's undeniable that it, what Matt Nabel gave uh, as a performer to that role and what the filmmakers and writers did in terms of developing that, that, that you know, yes, you're right, that the, 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 the coach has a different attitude to winning at the beginning and at the end of the book. I think it's, it's at the end of the series. I think it's there in the book as well. For me, when I was writing that that relationship, it was important to, um, I mean, I think there are, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very clear about how much I, uh, is due and uh, uh, the debt I have, and I no longer see this as a, a frightening or difficult thing, the debt I have to family, you know, the, the fact that I can be here in front of you and talk is built on a, that I come from a very similar family to Danny's, incredibly loyal and loving and um, generous and uh, uh, just kept me, kept me safe. But I'm also here because of amazing mentors I've met in my life. And that, that was what I, was what I wanted to write in the, in the book as well, that there are 
You know, and of course, Danny at 17, 18, 19, even at 22, he doesn't, he doesn't understand um, uh, the coach, the significance yeah. of it. It's only once he's come through his own pain. He's, he's dealt with shame. He's dealt with failure. Um, he, he's, he's dealt with um, uh, learning how to forgive, um, that he, can, he understands what the coach has given him. Um, I mean, I think that's in the book, but I, what Matt and the filmmakers did in the series is, uh, is an extension. Is it? Yeah. I, thought, I thought Matt was so beautiful. Ah, oh, yeah. My mum, one of the, like, <laughs> after it finished um, the, the, for the last episode, because mum, you know, she, there's no, she can't use a computer, so there's no way she's doing iView, but she was watching <laughs> it religiously every Sunday night, and um, she was just in tears going, I love that man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. <laughs> I, know, I, love, I, I, liked, I was the last one to find yeah. out he'd played rugby. I mean, go, go figure. Yeah. Um, before we finish up, because we have run out of time, I wanted to um, ask both of you to talk about your next projects. Oh, so I'm in a... I'm in a uh, I just wrote a second draft and I spent six hours, seven hours with... Um, I'm very lucky to be published by Jane Paul Freeman, who is also an, my editor from the right from the get-go mm -hmm. and a friend, and it's... Uh, and we pulled it apart and tore it apart, and I know what I have to do next. And it's going to be a long time, this one. It's about St. Paul. And it's called? Damascus. Interested in adapting that one, Tony? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Ancient Rome, Middle East settings. Perfect. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Tell us what's on your plate. Um, I uh, have a whole bunch of TV shows that I'm working on. We've got uh, the s third season of our kids' show, Nowhere Boys, coming out. Yep. Uh, second season of Supernatural show called Glitch, second season of Wanted, and second season of Family Law all coming out. And also next year, a, um, another book adaptation, Seven Types of Ambiguity by Elliot Perlman. Yes. God, I feel Fantastic. really lazy now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much to look forward to on the horizon. Please join me in thanking our guests, Tony and Christos. And Angela Savage. <laughs>